Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is good to gather and to worship our great God and our Savior. He's an amazing God, right? Um, if you would, turn in your, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3. We are actually going to be finishing Romans chapter 3 as we're, as we're making our way slowly through the, the book of Romans. And last week, we actually kind of turned a corner, and I talked about that in, in my sermon, that uh, one of the points that I made is it was like coming out of darkness into light. And we heard the gospel presented by, by Paul. And the amazing thing about the gospel is it really is about him. The gospel is about him and what he has done to accomplish our salvation. And, and so that we're going to see today the, the implications of that, that gospel. And, you know, I was thinking that, you know, this is not really part two because what has happened in those previous verses that we looked at last week is the gospel has, has been presented, but now what Paul's going to be doing is he, he's actually going to be um, bringing about and talking about the implications of the gospel. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. But, but when you think about it, really the implications of the gospel go really for the next eight chapters. If these verses, verses 21 through 26, are true, then this is true. And Paul's going to work through these things, and he's going to do this by asking some questions and answering those questions, what, what we know as a diatribe, and, and he, he's trying to get his readers to understand the implications, again, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How does that affect our lives? And then eventually we'll get to, to chapter 12, where he turns the corner. So he's given the gospel, he's presented the gospel, he's instructed us in the gospel, and now he says, therefore... Finally, after all that, 11 chapters, therefore, in view of God's mercy, because that's what the gospel is, the, the gospel is the mercy of God, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. That's where we want to get to. We've chosen to, to go through the book of Romans for, for good reason, because it is the greatest presentation of the gospel in the Word of God. And so, I just want to begin reading in chapter 3, verse 21, just to get the context from last week, and then we'll dive into our passage. So let's read verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by, through faith, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Let's pray. Father, we, we glory in you. You are our only boast. Lord, you have accomplished everything regarding our salvation. You have accomplished all of that through giving your one and only Son to, to be the, the propitiation, the sacrifice of atonement for us. Lord, it's because of you and what you have done, done in redeeming us that we are here to worship you and to glory in you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, let our only boast be in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Well, several years ago, when we were still pastoring at Hope Chapel, I was home one day on a Saturday, and I had a, a knock on the door, and you know, I, I looked out to see what it is. I thought maybe it was the Jehovah's Witnesses that came, came by, but at this time it wasn't. It was a young man by the name of Robert, and, and Robert was trying to gain some business, and so he was going door-to-door, to door, handing out his business card, just trying to get to know people, and I, I struck up a conversation with him, and I was thinking, you know, is this an opportunity for me? God, you brought this young man to my door so that I might preach the gospel to him, and, and as, we, as we were talking, I, I recognized the fact, and, I, I, and so I asked him, I said, do you, do you attend church? And so Robert's response kind of struck me. He said, yes, I, I go to Hope Chapel, and here I am thinking, okay, I'm a pastor at Hope Chapel. I, I go to every service, and, and I have never seen this person in my life. And so I knew that there was something that, that I had. I said, really? <laughs> really? I said, you go to Hope Chapel. Really? I'm, I'm a pastor there. And you could look at the blood leave his face. But it gave me an opportunity it gave, me, it gave me an opportunity to speak to him about the gospel. And, and, and so after that, I, I said to him, I said, so, so Robert, are you a Christian? And he said, yes. I said, well, so what makes you a Christian? And he said, of course, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Well, that's an indication to me that he's not a Christian, that he doesn't know the simplest facts about the gospel of Jesus Christ, because none of us are truly, we can call ourselves Christians, but none of us are truly Christians because we're good people. We're Christians because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and that's the doctrine that we're going to be looking at today, the doctrine of justification by faith. And, and it was true that in, in this little thing that, that Robert said, I'm a good person, there's what? Boasting. And that's true anytime we talk to, to people and they say, oh, wh why would you go to heaven? Because, what, I'm a, I'm a good person. That, there's a boasting. But brothers and sisters, we must understand that each and every one of us as Christians struggles with the sin of pride. Pride is, is really the root of, of just about every other sin, and, and pride is something that, that we, we long to, to get accolades from people, that people would say, oh, you, you know, you're wonderful. And when somebody says, oh, you did a, a great job last week on your sermon, what do I do? I want to I pat myself on my back and say, yeah, forgetting that that I can do nothing apart from Christ, that, that, that Christ is everything. But we all like that. We all have this desire to be, to be credited with something, and that's true even as Christians in our salvation because I'm guilty that when I'm doing good, I feel I'm accepted by God, and when I'm not doing good, I feel unaccepted by God. And that's a works righteousness. That's not the gospel. And I have to come to the place all the time where I say, I glory in you and you alone, and there's nothing I can do to, to make your love for me greater than it already is. And how do I know that? Because you demonstrated your love towards me, and that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And we all struggle with the sin of pride, and, and you can think of the most religious person, right? The most religious person says, yes, I have to earn my salvation from the beginning to end, but then there are those who say, you know, I have to do everything I can and God will fill in the gap. That's just as bad because the gap is everything. You now, we, we struggle with pride, and I read this little story about a man named Stacy King. Any basketball fans here? Stacy King was a, a player who played for the Chicago Bulls uh, when Michael Jordan was at his peak. And one night, Michael Jordan scored 69 points, and King scored one. <laughs> and King said later, he says, I'll always remember this is the night that Michael Jordan and I combined for 70 points. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, he was joking. He combined for 70 points. But isn't that what we want to do? 
God, look at me. Look at me. But when you come to the gospel, when, when you come to the, the glorious work of God, there's nothing in it that we can boast about. And so we're going to look at three implications of justification by faith. And Paul wants us to answer uh, the question, or he's going to answer these questions. And the first implication is this, justification by faith excludes boasting. We see that in verse 27 and 28. Then we're going to see justification by faith is the only means of salvation in verse 29 and 30. And then lastly, justification by faith upholds the law in verse 31. But beginning back in Romans chapter 3, verse 27, Paul is looking back and he's saying these verses in verse 21 through 26, and he, he's explained the doctrine of, of justification based on the finished work of Jesus Christ received by faith alone. And now he wants to, to bring out these implications. What does this look like now? He, like I said earlier, he's going to do that for the, the next eight chapters, and he does so for these next eight chapters because justification by faith is the heart of, of Christianity. Without justification by faith, Christianity does not exist. So he's going to spend all this time, it's the very heart of God's plan and how he is going to reconcile sinners to himself. It, it is, in effect, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And anybody... Any person who believes that God does a little bit and we do a little bit, or the person thinks that they can add something is missing it, and anybody that thinks that they can earn some part of their salvation is in dire need of understanding the truth of the gospel. Now, Paul is, is concerned for these, these believers in Rome, and there's both Jews and, and Gentile believers, and they're all becoming one, and, and Paul wants to speak to them and, and, and to clarify some things for them. And so, our first point, justification by faith excludes boasting. Verse 27 says this, then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. And I, I thought about this. There's a sign on the, the entrance of the, the, the church, no boasting allowed. You know, that we, when we come in this door, we can't say anything about ourselves. And that's what Paul is saying. It is excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And going back to, to Romans chapter 2, Paul, uh, the, the tendency of the Jewish people is to respond to the gospel by saying, Paul, wait a second, you, you don't know. Don't you realize that, that we are, are God's chosen people? We're the elect. We're the people that God has called to be his representatives in, in all the world. You, you, you're, misunder, you're, you're misunderstanding who we are, Paul. Paul wants to say, no, that's not true. You're misunderstanding why God had called you and how God had called you. And Paul is concerned about the kind of person who boasts in their own self-confidence, especially when, when he's talking to the Jewish people, because we, we look back in, in chapter 2 and it says that they were fond of boasting in their own confidence. So brothers and sisters, we have to remem remember that during your prayer time, that, that you say, God, there's nothing I can do to earn your love. It's about you and you alone, and, and I cannot be confident in anything in myself. You know, the Pharisees, at the time of Christ, especially prided themselves in, in keeping a law. They fasted, they prayed, they observed the Sabbath, they they had all their, their ceremonial washings, and they even, it says in Matthew 23, 23, that they even tied, tied their spices. I mean, could you mean that meticulous? You know, I, I have to do everything that the law says. And yet, what does Jesus do? He confronts them because they're not dealing with the hard issue. We can, all, we can be completely about our outward experience or our outward uh, the way we live, and we can come to church, and as Dennis was telling us to smile, and, and sometimes we're smiling, and sometimes we're putting on a happy face so that everybody in church thinks, wow, they've got it all together. There's other times we just need to let that, that down and say, hey, I'm in need. I'm in need of help, and that's why we're here. We're brothers and sisters in Christ that are here to encourage each other and to love each other and, and to call each other to, to, to put our eyes and our focus on Jesus Christ. But Jesus will go on and he'll confront the, the Pharisees and he'll say, you hypocrites, 
You hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the, the outside will become clean too. I mean, even Paul, before his conversion, he, he was somebody who could pride himself in who he was. I mean, he says in Galatians 1.14, he says that he was advancing in Judaism beyond more than all of his contemporaries. I mean, how many of us have that, that same heart of, of competition? You know, I want to, I want to be the best. I want, I want to succeed. In fact, you know, one of the things I love to do, and I, I used to love to play ping pong. And, but, but I would only play if I could win. So I stopped playing a couple years when I started playing Jeff. <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's part of who we are. And even, even as a culture, even as a culture, we, we boast in things. You know, I had an interview last week. And I have an interview t- tomorrow. But what do we do when we go to an interview? We go there and we tell them all the great things about us. <laughs> Look, this is who I am. This is what I've done. I'm thinking... You know, I'm just going to go into that interview tomorrow and just say, you know what, I love Jesus. <laughs> and I know, well, no, I'm, I can't say that. <laughs> and I, I know that he'll see me through every day. And that's true, right? But I can't. Because <laughs> they're going to ask me specific questions about, and, and I need to give specific answers. But, but that's what our culture does. It, 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 boasts, it boasts in ourselves. And, and that's one of the hardest things. And Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, he says this, he says, if, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I have more. He goes on, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul had great reason to boast. But he goes on, he says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, for Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. Again, this is justification by faith. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. I mean, Paul knew that and understood that, that salvation and justification were all of God and the basis of, of which a person w- would uh, become a Christian, that the, there's no room for pride. There's no room for pride and there's, there's no room left for boasting and there's no room for saying, well, you know, I, I didn't need this. You know, Paul came to that conclusion. And brothers and sisters, there's going to be a day that we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and none of us is going to be able to, to go before him and say, look at all that I did for you. you know, I was thinking about this. You have, you have the judgment seat of Christ, and you have a trap door, and you have to walk out of that trap door. What words are you going to say? Obviously, it's not that way, and it's not just about the words that we say. It's about what we've really put our faith and trust in. But if we say, look what I did, that trap door is just going to open. But we need the foundation of Jesus Christ, that, uh, these girders that will cover that trap door, that we'll stand on, and we'll say, it's not what I did, but it's what he did. It's what he did on my behalf. This is important, brothers and sisters, because faith in the Bible, when we look at faith in the Bible, it's always characterized by what? Humility. And that's true when you you look throughout the Old Testament and you look in in the New Testament, faith is always characterized by humility. Remember Isaiah, you know, I, I like to say this about Isaiah. Isaiah was probably the most godly man in the nation of Israel when he was prophesying to the nation of Israel. And then he goes into the temple and he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And his only response to the Lord is what? Woe is me, for I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips because my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. Is that 
Is that our attitude to, to the glorious living God? That we would see him and we would say, woe is me. Or, you know, and so that's the Old Testament. But you know, I think about the New Testament with, with the apostle Peter. And, and Peter, they're in, they're in the boat. And Jesus is preaching. And, and after, after Jesus is done preaching, he says to Peter, Peter, hey, just cast the net on the other side. And what's Peter's response? You know, Lord, we, I know better. You know, we, we were fishing all night long and we didn't catch anything. But because you ask, I'll do it. And so he casts the net over. And what happens? They, they pull on this. And what does Peter say? Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. No, faith in the Bible is always characterized by humility. And humility is, is part of who we are as Christians. And Paul is saying that the way that God saves us, humbles us, and leaves us uh, with, with nothing to boast in. So looking back at our verse in verse 27, he says, Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. And it was interesting because as I was studying that particular verse, I was, I was struggling because I was reading one comment one commentary, and, and they were saying that, oh, this means one thing. And then I'd read another commentary, and they say, no, it means this. And, and so I was actually conflicted, and, and I spent like hours wrestling through this one thing. And, and so what does, what does Paul mean in verse 27 that boasting is, is excluded by the law of faith? And, and there are two different views, and I can't go into them very long, but one view, and I call this view this, the, the one law view. The one law view, and, and this, this view basically states that when, when Paul says, the, by the law, not what kind of law, by the law of works, no, but by the law of faith, he's saying that the Old Testament law, or the Old Testament, speaks of Jesus Christ and his salvation. And so, when he's talking about the law of faith, he's talking about the Old Testament law, that rightly understood the Old Testament, when you rightly understand the Old Testament law, what it was for and what it was to accomplish would co- make you come to a place that you would believe in Jesus Christ. And there is some truth to that. There is some truth to that. In fact, when you look at chapter 4, verse, verse 3, he quotes from, from Genesis 15, 6. And he says, For what does the Scripture say? Looking back at the Old Testament, Abraham believed God, and was counted to him as righteousness. So looking back at the Old Testament, you see that the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith is there. So that's one view. But that's not the view that I hold and some great people do. But in the context, looking at chapter 3, verses 21 through 28, I think what Paul is doing is contrasting the righteousness that comes through faith with the Mosaic law. So he's contrasting these two things which I think leads to a natural question in verse 31 that says, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold it. So if the first view is correct, this doesn't really make sense in verse 31 because how would the law of faith do away with the law of faith? Okay, so that, does that, I hope that makes sense to you. But I like what Douglas Moo says. He says, what Paul is doing here is, is there's, there's a play on words, and when he refers to the law of faith, Paul is saying it, it, it's not the law of Moses which requires works. That, those, th- that law would exclude boasting. Rather, it's the, the law of faith that we find, what? In the new covenant. That by belief in Jesus Christ, that excludes any boasting. So then when we look, look at verse 28, what Paul is doing is he's he is uh, explaining in verse 28, he's explaining verse 27, for he says, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So our right standing before God, our justification, is not something that we earn by doing anything, but it is something that we receive as a gift through faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross as he is crucified for us and he becomes the propitiation for our sins. So the grounds to our being accepted by God have nothing to do with our own good works. So as we stand before the, the judgment seat, is not what we have done, but what he has done. Amen? Let's move to the second point. The second implication of justi- 
justification by faith is the only is that justification by faith is the only means of salvation. We see this in verse 29 and 30. Verse 29 says, Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. And the reason that Paul wants us to see this is, you know, as I said earlier, there's this mixed congregation of, of both Jews and, and Gentiles. And when it comes to salvation, when it comes to justification, there's only one way that the people of God can be saved. And if God is one and God is just, he's not going to have two different ways of people being saved. He's not going to say, okay, well, for the Jews, you have to do it this way, and for the Gentiles, you have to do it. No, he's trying to bring people in, and he, he's really looking back at Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And he's saying, based on that, and if God is one, he must be the God of the Jews and the God of the Gentiles. And we see this throughout the Old Testament, that, that God is not just simply the God of the Jews. God is the God of the whole world. And so as Gentiles come into faith with Jesus, through Jesus Christ, they understand that they are part of that, that one body. And indeed, you know, th this whole idea that God is one is central to the Jewish faith, but there was an unbiblical hardness of heart that they had towards Gentile believers. And some of them were, were just simply blinded um, by the truth of justification by faith that Paul was preaching. Paul's preaching, and, and so Paul emphasizes again that there's only one way of salvation for both Jew and Gentile. There's one way of being accepted by God. But for us, I mean, when, when, we, when we think about it, what? Salvation was what? To the Jews. But in the coming of Christ, God opens up this door for us as, as Gentiles, and for us, we, we glory in that. I mean, Paul will say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, he says this, he says, Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's who we were. We were with no hope and without God in the world. And we know that God in his mercy chose the people of the, the Old Testament, the Jewish nation, to be the, the representation of his, of his kingdom here on earth. And we know that there was a time when, when very few Gentiles were actually coming into the, the nation of, of Israel, and, and the nation of Israel was actually putting up walls of, of separation, not allowing people to come in, but now God has broken down the, the walls of separation that he can bring both Jews and Gentiles into one common family through faith in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the Messiah of the nation of Israel, just as much as he's the, our Savior as well. You know, but it's extremely difficult for, for people, when we talk to Jewish people, for them to grasp the truth of the gospel and understand that, that Jesus is the Messiah, and they've put these, these walls up. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 through 24, Paul says this. He says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, Paul says that the gospel that we preach is is folly and foolishness and a stumbling block to the Jews and the Gentiles. Don't get offended when we go out and preach the gospel to people and they don't believe it. Because, as Paul said, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God can use the gospel that we preach in the way that He wants to use it. It may be foolishness and folly to some, but it's going to be life from the dead to others. And we don't know who God has called to, to do that in. in. Romans 9, verse 3, Paul says, For I could wish myself that, 
that, my, that I were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Why does he say that? Because Paul had a great love for the Jewish people. And, and Jewish people, as we preach the gospel, they could think, oh, you know, Paul, Paul doesn't love the Jews. Paul was a Jew. He was a Jew, and he had a great desire for his countrymen to be saved. And Paul wants his, his readers to know that. He, does, he doesn't want them to think that he doesn't care for them, but he does care for them. And he wants them to know justification by faith alone. But sadly, there are some today, even in the church, hopefully not in this church, but even in the church, that, that believe that Jewish people can be saved apart from the gospel, that, that they can be saved one way and, and that we're saved another way and God just has a special plan for them. But brothers and sisters, that's not true. That's exactly what Paul is saying. There's only one way of salvation. Verse 30 again, he says this. He says, God is one. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. There's not two standards for both Jews and, and Gentiles. And Paul knows that if there's only one God and there's only one standard of righteousness, and if there's only one standard of righteousness, then there, there's only one way to satisfy that standard, and that's through Jesus Christ. It's not through anything that we can do. There's only one way of salvation. And Paul is, is trying to nail that point and say, do you understand this? Now, again, I know that there are many people even today that profess to be Christians who believe that, that, you know, there's all different roads to heaven. I'm sure you probably know some people that just simply believe that you can go this way and you can believe in Islam and eventually you get to heaven. You can believe in Judaism and you can get to heaven. You can be a Buddhist and eventually get to heaven. But have you noticed that when we preach justif justification by faith alone, what, what do they say of us? We're closed-minded. We're bigoted. We're, we're intolerant. And that would be true if, if it was something that we just simply made up. We're saying that you have to follow this because this is what we believe. No, but the truth is the Bible teaches that. But when people say that, that justification by faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work, you don't need that. What are they saying? In effect, they're being intolerant of the work that Christ has done. What they're saying about the cross is that in, it's in some way insufficient or it's unnecessary. Well, when they stand before God, what's going to happen? When they stand before God, and are they going to be able to say, you know what, Christ's death and His, His finished work is unnecessary? It's insufficient? No. But that's what they'll be doing if they say that Christ is only one way. He didn't really need to die for the sins of the world because Jesus didn't come, understand this, Jesus didn't come just to be a good teacher like so many people suppose. Jesus came for a purpose, to be the propitiation for our sins and to appease the wrath of God that was upon us. So that brings me to our third point which is this, justification by faith upholds the law. Justification by faith upholds the law. Verse 31 says, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. You know, everywhere that Paul went, there was an ongoing objection to justification by faith, and this is something that Paul had to deal with over and over. They, they accused Paul of, of doing away with the law. They accused Paul of speaking against the law of Moses. They accused Paul of teaching that you could go on sinning, that, that grace may abound. And Paul was accused of saying that o obedience doesn't matter. Paul was accused of saying that there's no place for works in Christianity. And Paul's response to that is, that's not so. He says, may it never be that, that that would be so. For Paul, justification by faith actually upholds the law. Justification by faith, understood correctly, doesn't lead us to, to reject the law. It leads us to love the law for its intended purpose. 
I mean, brothers and sisters, we, we come to Jesus Christ through faith, and He saves us. He, he changes us. He changes us, and, and He pours out His Spirit into our hearts, and He, he, he puts the law within our hearts that we want, might want to obey Him. I mean, Paul will say in, in Ephesians tap, chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, he'll say this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. What he's saying is that we don't cr- contribute anything to God's acceptance of you or of us as being righteous. We don't contribute anything to, to justification by faith. But then he goes on in verse 10. He says, for we are what? His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them cares. He cares what we do. He doesn't just expect us to come to faith in Jesus Christ and simply stop there. We're going to see throughout the book of Romans that he calls us to to live a life of holiness and and sanctification, that that we would grow in our sanctification. Yes, justification is the free gift of God. Sanctification is the ongoing process that by which we live a holy life. Paul understands that that the law has come, become a, a, our tutor to, to lead us to Christ. And, and so I, I want you to understand that when we become Christians, we, we're not under the law. We don't keep the law to earn our salvation in any way, but, but there are things in the law that, that teach us who, who we are in Christ and how we are to live. I mean, Paul's point in, in verse 20 of, of Romans chapter 3 He says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes a knowledge of sin. He'll say in Galatians, the law has become our tutor to to bring us to to Christ. And I was thinking about this. If you had a tutor that you were raised with, that you met with day in and day out, and you you knew that they cared about you, and and they were pointing you in the right direction, trying to get you to the place where you would be on your own and self-sufficient, and then all of a sudden, that day that you became self, self-sufficient, you just said, oh, I don't need you anymore. Just get out of my life. Paul's saying, no, that, that's not what we, the way we look at the law. The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. We should love the law. We should look back at it and say, I'm so grateful for the law that it, that it taught me that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. But besides that, an, another thing that the law does, it, it, it points us to the fact that, that we can never live our lives in a way that pleases God, and therefore Christ dies as the sacrifice intended for us. And so we, law, we look back at the law and we say, I'm so grateful for the Old Testament and the Old Testament law that it shows me that Christ is the sacrifice for my sins. And then as we're going to see Later on in Romans chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, Paul says this. He says, For God has has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. See, the law could not accomplish what God wanted it to do because we were weak. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for our sin. He condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You know, that's one of the great differences in becoming a Christian. The law that that recently crushed to death, crushed you, to death is the law that you delight to obey in the power of the Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Paul, I mean, when we think of the law and it pointing out all the sin that we have committed, and it pointing out our, our inability to come to God through our own works, that's the same law that shows us who Christ is and what He's done for us and, and teaches us that we need to put our faith and trust in Him. So we look to the law and we say, thank you for the law. And because of this, we get excited and we say, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that, that God has done this. And, 
that he sees in the gospel that God has righteously maintaining his own righteousness. As we, we looked at last week in, in verse 26, he says, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We, when we understand all that God has done, that he is both the just and the justifier, you know, we, we come to a place of awe and we say, you know, how deep your, your love is for us, God. And we stand in awe of him and we realize that, that it's impossible for us to boast in anything of ourselves. And we sang that earlier how, in the song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. He, he says this, he says, I will not boast in anything no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. That's what we, we grab onto. We grab onto the fact that, that God has done it all. No boasting allowed. There's only one way of salvation, and we look to, to His Word and we say, God, we, we thank You for His Word, both Old and New Testaments. We don't neglect the old because we have the new. We look to the old for instruction on, on what it means to, to, to serve a holy and awesome God, and we look to the new to see His finished work through His Son on the cross. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the finished work of, of your son on, on the cross, that, that he was willing to suffer and sacrifice himself for us. Lord, we know that it's not about us, it's about you. Father, I pray that you would have our way, have your way in our hearts, Lord, that we would honor you in every aspect of our lives. Lord, that we would not see your grace as a license, but, Lord, we would long to live a holy and righteous life. And, Lord, for those who are with us who, who are not longing, who are not longing for your kingdom and your righteousness, God, I pray that, that Lord, you would spark in them a desire to serve you and to love you and to honor you. For those of us who who already love you. God, give us a great passion for you and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.